hope this works. Once we get confirmation that we're live, then we can start rolling. Yeah. We are. Um, yeah, oh, yeah. Yes. I think we're live. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> welcome, everybody. Welcome back to the Stand to Reason book club. Um, you are looking at your three hosts, myself, Alan Schleeman, John Noyes, Tim Barnett, Stand to Reason speakers. We are back for our second book club this year. Uh, the first one we did because we were in a COVID lockdown, right? Well, I guess we kind of still are. Is that right, guys? We are definitely. Tim, are you still a, you're in the you're in the lockdown up there in Canada? Yeah, not not much has changed here um, in the last few months. I mean, there has been some opening up, but um, it's still pretty pretty locked down. You got to go to church this weekend. Yeah, that was a first. So first time in six months we did uh, we did church. Um, but it was, you know, there was a lot of, uh, restrictions and, and, uh, you know, protocols that we had to follow. So it didn't look like normal church. Mm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So this, <laughs> this is our second, uh, book club. The, the plan is that we are going to be doing a little bit, a little bit things a little bit different this time than last time. So last time we met every week. Uh, this time, what we're going to be doing is meeting every other week. So the official dates for this book club are going to be every other Thursday starting today. Um, and we are meeting at 1 p.m. Pacific time. And we will be ending on December 3rd. So that, if my calculations are correct, I think that's seven episodes, mm -hmm. which is the number of completion of the Bible, coincidentally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that was planned, but uh, that works out nicely. Uh, so yeah, so every other Thursday, starting today until December 3rd, and we are going to be going over the book, um, The Universe Next Door by James Sire. And it turns out that um, the most recent edition is the sixth edition, which just came out, which is just published like a month or two ago, I think. Not, I mean, super, super recently. So this is like hot off the press. It's still a little bit warm. That could just be our, <laughs> our temperatures, though. Uh, I'm in San Diego, so it is a little warm here. But um, anyways, either way, it's uh, super new. Uh, I know there was a question earlier about whether we can, uh, whether someone's following along and they don't have the sixth edition, but they have a previous edition. And was it Tim or John? Did one of you answer that question? What was the... Yeah, you know what? I, I chimed in on that one and said it would be fine. Um to have probably any of the additions. Um, what we're gonna do in the club, and you're gonna get to this, is we're not gonna necessarily be going through line by line all the content. We're not reading the book here, um, like on live on, on Facebook or YouTube. We're just gonna be talking about the things that jump out at us, things we agree with, things we disagree with, right? And so um, there are things in the new, in the sixth edition that aren't in some of the other editions. Um, but that's fine. We're going to, we're going to bring it up. In fact, we're going to bring in some material. We're going to devote a whole session to cl critical theory, Marxism, which is touched on in the book, but we're going to bring a lot of, uh, content from outside the book. So there's just one example of, uh, how you, you, you just, you, you probably don't need to have the latest edition to be able to follow, follow along. I agree. I'm convinced that was super persuasive. Sure. You should be an apologist. That's amazing. All right. Um, okay. So I, I just wanted to, so before we get, jump into the material, so um, we are going to be covering the, today's session, uh, chapters one and two. Okay. So chapter one is an introduction. Chapter two is on Christian theism. Mm. So if you have the book or if you're familiar with the book, um, each of the chapters is addressing one particular worldview. So you'll have, you know, a chapter on Christian theism, one on deism, one on naturalism, nihilism, existentialism, pantheism, you know, so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, chapter one, though, is just an introduction to the idea of worldview, to the outline of the book. And so we'll begin with that and then also cover Christian theism. And so we're kind of covering two chapters because, um, well, Christian theism is, 
perhaps the the worldview of well, it is the worldview of Tim and John and myself, uh, but most likely the worldview of the majority of you guys who are watching. So we're not going to spend as much time on that, um, but we're dividing up our time today with Christian theism and um, the introduction. Yeah, and likely as we go through here, uh, when we address um, the content in the book on on naturalism or or you know postmodernism or whatever, we'll be contrasting you know, what that worldview teaches next to the Christian worldview. So the Christian worldview will likely come up as we go along. Yeah. Well, that's natural, right? We should be, as we're reading, comparing it to um, what we know to be true. What happens if we become convinced of another worldview <laughs> in the middle of this process? Yeah, it lied. Like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be a pantheist. Like, <laughs> yeah. I wonder so, if my like, stand of reason will send me my pink slip, like in the mail, yeah. like, for the next <laughs> you know, episode. Right? That's right. <laughs> so, Alan, why don't you uh, why don't you tell us why we uh, why we chose this book? Well, yeah. Um, well, I'll give you one reason. I'll give you <laughs> one of the reasons. I, for, so, for me, I, I mean, this is somewhat of a uh, personal slash selfish motivation. Uh, I love the idea of worldviews and studying worldviews because um, worldviews help to organize information and categorize it and put it into digestible chunks, which um, I think this book does really well. Now, I, I read, I think, like the third edition, I mean, 20 or 30 years ago. So I haven't read this in a long time. And uh, but I think it's it's important for me to have a refresher right now because of just how important I think worldviews are with regards to how they are playing themselves out in our culture today. Mm -hmm. And so um, to kind of illustrate that, I want, I want to quote Francis Schaeffer, something he wrote in his book, A Christian Manifesto. And um, <clears throat> I, I think I have this quote in an article I wrote like a few weeks ago or maybe a month ago. Um, and the article is something like, today's tumultuous times are a result of a worldview. So I, I kind of unpack the quote there. But let me just read the quote now and just quickly unpack why I think this book is so important for us today. So Schaefer, <clears throat> one of our favorite authors here, uh, he writes this. He says, the basic problem of the Christians in this country in the last 80 years or so in regard to society and in regard to government is that they have seen things in bits and pieces instead of totals. They have, they have very gradually become disturbed, disturbed over permissiveness, pornography, the public schools, the breakdown of the family, and finally abortion. Now, let me just pause here for a moment. So um, obviously says, and finally abortion, right? That's because he was writing in, I think this book was published in, or, a Christian Manifesto was published in 1980 or 81, I think. 81. So this is just like seven or so years after uh, after abortion was legalized. Now, obviously, since then, there's been other things that Christians have gotten worked up about, like same-sex marriage and, of course, now critical theory and a whole bunch of other things. But this is why he says, and finally, abortion. Hmm. But he continues. He says this. They have not seen this as a totality each thing being part of a, a, a part, a symptom of a much larger problem. They have failed to see that all of this has come about due to a shift in worldview. That is, through a fundamental change in the overall way people think and view the world and life as a whole. Yeah. What we must understand is that worldviews really do bring forth with inevitable certainty, not only personal differences, but also total differences in regard to society, government, and law. Mm. And I, man, I, again, I, if you want to kind of see that quote again, just go to that article. But I think this is so critical to understand because especially today, and we, you know, Tim made mention that we're going to address this in a few weeks or so, but when it comes to a lot of the ideas, the bits and pieces, as Francis Schaeffer, Francis Schaeffer says, like cancel culture, white privilege, intersectionality, microaggressions, and all this stuff, we tend to, as Christians, see these as bits and pieces and, and, and oftentimes try to address each of these as individual things, when in reality, they are part of a much larger worldview, a much larger total system of thinking. And in this case, you know, um, critical theory, which is probably fits into a much larger worldview of naturalism. Mm -hmm. And so because people have bought into that worldview, they 
as Schaefer says, with inevitable certainty, these bits and pieces come out in culture. And so this is why I think such a book like this is so critical for us today, because we are seeing a prime example of the bits and pieces of a worldview being fleshed out in our culture and literally every day on the news. And if you want to make sense of it, you got to understand the worldviews behind it. Yeah. And so this is why I'm really excited about it because for me, even this is going to be an important um, refresher or just instructional tool. I, I mean, I'm sure I'll, I'm going to learn a lot uh, just by going through this. So this is one of the reasons I think it's so important. That's good. Yeah. That's, that's good, Alan. I, uh, I agree. I think we spend a lot of time um, and we should uh, um, addressing specifics, you know, sp the specifics of abortion, obviously, and, and some of these other issues that, that Schaefer mentioned. Um, but it's true that oftentimes we, uh, you know, what the expression is, uh, uh, miss the forest for the trees, right? And, and there's, a, there's always this bigger picture going on. And that's, I, I use the word picture because that's how I think of a worldview. And we'll get to that in a second. But um, oftentimes there's a worldview. And inside that worldview, there's certain specific beliefs that find their home. Mm. And, um, and, and I think we, as apologists, we do ourselves a disservice when we, when, we, when we neglect to focus in on what that worldview is. Because oftentimes we can respond um, more appropriately by addressing at the worldview level than just at the specific issue level. Yeah. Um, so, and I think we'll see that as we go. Yeah. Well, addressing things from the worldview level, I think adds a layer of cohesiveness to the issues that we're addressing, like that, that's Schaefer's, I think, point is we need to think of uh, think of the all of reality according to a worldview. And then sometimes when we do this, I love Greg's talk on atheism, you know, bumping into reality. Mm -hmm. As we do this, as we start to apply our Christian worldview to all the areas of life, sometimes we're going to have bumps into reality where we're not maybe allowing our Christian views to um, inform that area of our life. So there's inconsistencies there. And that's one of the things Sire uh, mentions kind of up front in the book is that uh, oftentimes we don't, we don't spend much time. We don't do deep dives into our personal worldview unless you are a speaker and author with stand the reason or something, you know, it's like, I mean, how many, uh, I'm also a, a pastor, right? And so are you, Tim, like how many times do you guys <clears throat> uh, come into a, run into a congregant that's like in a deep uh, existential crisis because they're digging into their worldview. I mean, it never happens. I mean, once in a blue moon. Yeah. But um, yeah. but that's what excites me about this whole thing is uh, being able to take up. For me, I feel like I'm taking a step back and I'm so caught up in the weeds, I feel like sometimes of the issues of the day that I'm able now to kind of take a step back and look from a worldview perspective. And then we apply biblical Christianity, Christian theism on top of these issues and we'll see that things make a whole lot a whole lot more sense mm -hmm. uh, yeah. as, as we dig into the harder topics I, so John, I'm, I'm, I, think, I was just gonna say I think you're right there's lots of people who um, don't even realize they have a worldview like they just don't think about these kinds of things at this deeper level and so there may be some people um, watching or uh, people watching may know someone who, who might push back right off the bat and say, look it, I don't, I don't have a worldview. What are you guys talking about? <laughs> and so what would you, what, what would you guys say uh, to, to that, um, that challenge? I always, uh, when I, if I'm speaking to youth, I always say worldviews are like belly buttons. Everybody has one, right? <laughs> and not uh, everyone has a nice one. Except for Adam and Eve. Not, not every, and not all belly buttons are equal. Yeah, uh, you know, that's right. that's, I think that that's a good that that's a good uh, picture for people to have. When, and that's part of the tricky things about worldviews is everybody has one, whether you realize it or not. Yeah. And then sometimes the worldview, and maybe we'll talk about this a little bit. Sometimes the worldview yeah. that you think you have, you don't actually have. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. That's, that's actually going to come up here in in chapter one. Um, Thomas Jeb here saying, I don't have the book yet. I'm going to be ordering it in the morning, which of course, totally fine because you have two weeks until, uh, chat, or, or, sorry, week until episode two. So you got plenty of time. That's, uh, yeah, you don't have to worry about that. Um, 
And it looks like somebody already read the whole thing <laughs> in one week. Good job, awesome. Duffy. That's awesome. awesome. Yeah. So we bring uh, him on and he can lead us through it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe Duffy could <laughs> um yeah, give us some sneak yeah. peeks or um yeah, really. Give us some advice here how to go through this. So yeah, I haven't gone through it yet. I've only just gone through the two chapters that we're supposed to cover today. So I used to teach at a at a local Bible college, Eternity Bible College here in uh, Southern California. And I taught a it was for all intents and purposes a worldview class. And this was our go-to text. This was the main text that we used for the semester uh, because it's just so good. Yeah. Um, the yeah. content is so good. It's clear. He, he goes through uh, these worldviews in the perfect amount of depth. Uh, yeah. It's not too much. It's not uh, too little. So right. I'm looking forward. And I think, uh, I think someone from Standard Reasons um, following along here. So if you can, whoever it is, put a link in the, um, in the chat of – um, where they can find the book. I know standard reason, I think we're selling it. So uh, if you want to throw up a link for that, yeah, um, we appreciate whoever's it's probably Madison, I'm assuming. Right. Or <laughs> if you're following, throw in a link for us. That'd be great. Um, yeah, so, that'd be great. Um, so yeah, we've used the word, uh, worldview, um, a number of times since we've, you know, just been on here for 15 minutes. So it might be a, it might be a good, uh, time to, uh, especially people who aren't familiar with these concepts, maybe we define what, at least without how the book defines worldview, and then we can weigh in on on maybe the definition that we use and go from there. Sure. Yeah. So page six, chapter one, um, Sire gives um, a, a, the definition of the worldview that he's using. So here it is. A worldview is a commitment, a fundamental orientation of the heart, that can be expressed as a story or in a set of presuppositions that we hold about the basic constitution of reality and that provides the foundation on which we live and move and have our being. So that's kind of a mouthful, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> in fact, we, were, we, were, we were all commenting how we wouldn't have, like <clears throat> if we were to write an article, and I'm sure we have, uh, and define worldview, we don't typically define it that way, do we? But no. Um, he actually has it dis uh, defined much longer than that. I actually skipped some of the parentheses and what was included in the parentheses there. So, for example, he says um, a worldview is a commitment uh, that can be expressed as a story in a set of presuppositions. And then in parentheses regarding those presuppositions, he says presuppositions are assumptions which may be true, partially true, or entirely false. Which I think is actually an important clarification about the presuppositions that somebody might have. Yeah. And then also when he talks about um, these prepositions that we hold, we hold them either consciously, subconsciously, consistently, or inconsistently. So, you yeah. know, there's a bunch of qualifications. So it is a mouthful of a, of a definition. Does do one of you want to offer a more succinct definition? Sure. I'll, I'll start. Um, man, when I read that, I thought, I would, if I was teaching this to high schoolers, there's no way I'm reading this definition. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, you, you, you're not going to track with it. And right. uh, sometimes I think um, philosophers, you know, um, of course we want to go deep and we want to define everything and make sure we're crystal clear. But here, sometimes concise is better. And I just, I mean, this is real simple. Worldview is your view of the world. Okay. It's your, it's your set of, when I say view, I mean your set of beliefs about what you think the world is like, okay? And, um, and I often, I mean, when I'm talking about this, I'll either use the picture language. I got this set from uh, uh, Greg Kokel, you know, um, picture of reality, your story of reality, your picture of reality, okay? And uh, I think the best illustration for a worldview is to think of a, a geographical map okay so a geographical map back in the day when you'd get the map out and you'd never be able to fold that thing back together <laughs> you, you guys some of you watching yeah. will remember those days before you could hop on you know google maps or whatever you had to use a real map and i remember those days and there were roads <laughs> there's roads and there's there's lakes and there's you know all that stuff's on there your parks and 
here's the thing. If you want to, um, you, you want a good map that matches up with real roads. So the lines on the map that represent roads, you want those to match up with real roads, real highways, right? And, and, and so you describe, I describe it like that. And there are some maps that aren't very good. Maybe you have an old map. It doesn't have the right roads on it, you know, or they've changed lo the location of certain things. Maybe they closed a street down or something. Maybe you, you have Apple Maps. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so you want you want a map that's gonna that's gonna correspond with reality. Good maps. Well, that's you, you, you'll find where you're going. You have a bad map. You, you're gonna get lost. There's gonna be consequences. The same is yeah. true about your worldview. Your worldview is like a map. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a really good uh, illustration, Tim. You know, it's because um, a, a world where, like, like a map, it's a framework, right, from which we view reality. When we say reality, one of the things I like to clarify is reality is the way the world really is. So that's how I say. That's how I teach my kids about it. So it's a it's a framework from which we view reality and make sense of the world around us and. Oftentimes people, I think they think uh, a worldview extends to, you know, philosophy and apologetics and theology and science and these things, but it actually has to do with every area of our life. There's nothing um, that our worldview doesn't take hold of, or at least inform. Um, yeah. So it's a, it's a holistic story uh, about the way the world actually is, is how I like to kind of describe mm -hmm. it, if that makes sense. Yeah, good. That's good. So um, one of the things I know um, was interesting was the, the, the point about it provides a foundation on which we live and move and have our being. And this whole idea of us living consistently with our worldview and or inconsistently with our worldview. In fact, you were, John, just alluding to that uh, just a minute ago, right? Because... Um, yeah. He, he makes a point on chat and I'm sorry, on page eight that he says, it's important to note that our own worldview may not be what we think it is. It is rather what we show it to be by our words and actions. You know, and he, he keeps coming back to this idea that our very actions may belie our self knowledge. Right. And yeah. he says, uh, if you want clarity about our own worldview, however, we must reflect and profoundly consider how we actually behave. So I'm just kind of skipping over a couple areas, but he goes keeps going back to this idea that we might say, oh, yeah, yeah, we have a Christian worldview. But if you really want to know what your worldview is, you might look at what your thoughts and your actions are because your behavior will speak mm -hmm. more to the truth about what you believe yeah. than um, what you say you do. Yeah. This, this for me, like when we start thinking worldviews, it, it adds a lot of clarity to the stuff that's going on out there in the world around us because because i think the 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 world where the, the the society that we find ourselves in the culture that we find ourselves isn't straining under necessarily you know socioeconomic or political tensions ultimately ultimately it's straining under differing world views and when we offer uh worldview answers and solutions i think we start getting clarity uh at, at, we start getting clarity to the deepest issues of the day you know, and and one of the things that Sire brought out with this specifically, what you're talking about here on page eight, uh, for me is just reinforces the idea that we really need to be thinking Christianly about all of life, um, and and we need to be seizing the opportunity to be everyday ambassadors and, and speak and, and embody uh, the you know the eternal truths of uh, the gospel of Jesus and and what that offers our culture, and oftentimes we. Uh, I think whether knowingly or, or not, we hold views that are divergent from they're they're not in, they're not consistent with the Christian worldview or Christian ethic. Um, and sometimes we uh, I mean, I know I've run into this very practically. I mean, we can get into this if, if we want, but of people who would claim that they're they're one thing, but what they're saying doesn't line up with that. And I'm not necessarily talking about Christians who think they're Christians and they're not. I'm also talking about the naturalist, the atheist. Who uh, who says he's atheistic or naturalistic, and all of a sudden they're going to appeal to a a, a a transcendent moral law or something like that? And it's like, whoa, wait a second, you're, what you're saying is not lining up with your worldview. Mm -hmm. And uh, consistency matters in these things because it informs a larger picture of how we view everything of life. 
So yeah. it's super important. Yeah, John, yeah. I'm curious. Um, you know, this is part of your own testimony too, right? I mean, you give a talk, uh, essentially like the bumping, the naturalist bumping into reality, yeah. right? Um, that's that's part of your testimony. And so for you personally, was there was a tension that you saw, right? Between um, kind of what you were, what your worldview could, could what, what it could handle. And then, but, but ultimately, you know, what you, you came to believe about the real, about reality. And, yeah. and it was in that tension, right? That you said, Hey, I, I'm, I'm going to go with Christianity over the naturalistic worldview. Yeah. And it, I mean, this is definitely just, I mean, I'd, I'd lead off by saying it's anecdotal, right? So it's just my story. Sure. But, yeah. but as I, and I wish Rihanna was here to my wife to, to kind of help us understand this, but like, as I was processing things, I started very intentionally trying to live consistently with my naturalism. Mm. So I was trying to be very intellectually honest with myself. And it, it happened around the time I moved to California. And as I leaned into naturalism, it actually led to some really uh, hard and dark places. I'm just being honest. Like this is just where it led to me. I, I um, and it led there very quickly. And then also when I, and I, like what Greg says, you know, I had these bumps into reality um, uh, about certain areas. Well, one would be, you know, a, a, a very real ethic, you know, there's, there is right and wrong. And where's that come from? And, and that's the obvious one that everybody brings up, but there were others, mm. um, purpose and meaning, destiny, a sense of transcendence, a sense of purpose that that's, that's outside of myself. Again, this is anecdotal. I don't know if I'd use this as an argument necessarily to try to convince yeah. somebody. Um, but yeah, you, you bump into those things uh, pretty hard and then you're, you're left with, uh, you, you've either, you've either got to follow reality where it goes or that you got to continue in your bumps. Yeah. And I, I wasn't able to continue with my bumps anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. They got to be too hard. So, uh, and then eventually, you know, uh, through a series of events, uh, coming to Christ, mm -hmm. but uh, it's not hard changing worldviews guys. Um, you know, I just talked to Abdu Murray. Uh, you, this is this is a guy who, if you guys don't know who he is, uh, he is a well. You, I know you guys do here, but if you're you guys watching, don't know who he is. He's a former Muslim. He's now with Rabbi Zacharias in National Ministries. And when we see these stories of Muslims having a worldview change, it yeah. comes at a real cost, hmm. a very real, practical hmm. cost. So, hmm. right. anyways, that's a good question, Tim. <clears throat> Yeah, it's a good question because it was about you. That's great. Well, it sounds to me, wanna, yeah, yeah. Alan, let me ask you a question. No. Now, uh, there, it seems to me you brought up two things there, and, and this isn't explicit in the book. Maybe it should be. Um, there's, and I know Ravi talks about this, and uh, I think you just hinted at it, John. There's two things there. One was there was the, you were trying to be consistent in your worldview. So there's there's two tests. There's the coherence yeah. test. It's okay, taking all the beliefs in this worldview and trying to hold them together. Is it possible? Or is there contradictions in there? So there's there's the, the coherence test. Mm -hmm. And I mean, technically you could have a perfectly coherent worldview, mm -hmm. but it's still not be true, okay? Right. Um, mm -hmm. Because what you you because I mean I hold to the correspondence theory of truth. So you got coherence, coherence test, and then you have the which is an internal test for the worldview. Then the external test, which is the correspondence test. And this is does this worldview match up with or correspond to reality, the real world, the way the world really is? That to me is and so you had both of those things in play. Uh, it seems to me in your in your uh, search for truth there. Yeah. Um, now I don't. Did you guys? I maybe I missed it, but I didn't see that explicitly coming out um, in the in the book. Well, I think it's implied through the questions. The uh, in the book, the eight basic questions that we try to apply to a worldview. Yeah. And so, and as we explore the different worldviews, Sire's going to. Uh, put these these questions on top of the worldview and see if it see mm -hmm. if they make sense. See yeah. if there's correspondence uh, to reality. Yeah, yeah. So it's a perfect segue. In fact, <clears throat> we should jump into that since you mentioned it, John. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So what Sire does basically in this introduction is say, "All right, look, what 
he's going to be doing through each chapter and consequently each worldview is asking these eight basic questions of every worldview, Christian theism, uh, naturalism, pantheism, so on and so forth. So, um, and this is the way he structures and organizes his, his entire book. So normally, again, we're not going to, you know, every time we do a new chapter, we're not going to try to unpack everything there, but we feel like, you know, pointing out these eight basic questions is key because it's, you know, it's the, it's the way he approaches the entire um, rest of the book. It's the grid by which he assesses each of these worldviews. Um, okay, so the first question he's going to ask of all the worldviews is what is prime reality? Mm -hmm. or, or in other words, what's really real? You know, is it, is it God? Uh, is it the cosmos? Like what, what's the prime reality? Yeah. You, know? um, you guys want to say anything about that? Or is that pretty, is that self-explanatory and, or yeah, this, this, that? how we answer this is going to uh, put lanes. It's like a bowling alley, right? There's yeah there's lanes that are going to be built and how we answer this first question is going to dictate where we can and cannot go. So if you have a, if you have a worldview that the prime reality includes the existence of God, that's going to lead us. There's, there's going to be certain worldviews that are accessible to us. But if we have a worldview that starts with the presupposition that there is no God, yeah. there's going to be that's going to be a whole other lane. And the other the worldviews aren't going to there, there's no mis mismashing. The mess mismashing mess mismashing. I know what you meant. That's a really Thanks. good point, by the way. I'm really thank glad you, you pointed so, that. Alan, thank you for the affirmation. Yeah, well, I just, it's so easy to affirm you because you're just so right so often. It's, <laughs> and you're and so like, easy. Unlike so Tim. Yeah. Show. <laughs> well, this this might be a good time. Um, and this, this occurred to me, and I mentioned this to you guys um, earlier today. Um, it's another way to think of a worldview is like a web of beliefs, okay? And if you have a, think of a spider web mm -hmm. and there are, and, and think about coming along and cutting the strands of a spider web. If you cut the outside strands, I mean, they're less important. You can kind of still hold things together than the things in the center, okay? And uh, it seems to me when you ask the question, what is the prime reality? This is a huge question. This is a yeah. huge metaphysical question. How you answer this question is now going to dictate, as John just said, which lanes are available to you. And so when, when a theist says this is God, God is the prime reality, all of a sudden this, this um, dictates now how you answer a whole bunch of other questions that we're going to get mm -hmm. to, like mm -hmm. the nature of external reality and, and what it means to be human, and et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And it occurred to me as we're going through this, and this may ex uh, upset some atheists if, they, if, they, if they're watching or they watch this later on. Some will say that atheism is just a lack of belief. You know, it's just, I just don't have a belief in God. No big deal, okay? Um, th here's my problem with that kind of claim. It's that it is a big deal because this is so central in the web. If, if you have God there, then all of a sudden your metaphysics, your ethics, your epistemology, all of these things are going to be affected by this particular belief, okay? And now if you don't have God as that belief, you have something else as that belief. And that is going to have implications for your metaphysics and for your epistemology and for your ethics, okay? And so this is such a huge question. I think there are, uh, I'm not saying all atheists believe this. I know there are atheists and agnostics who think the God question is a huge question, okay? Yeah because it, of, they, they see the implications of this. Um, and so it's not like all beliefs are equal. Like I lack belief in God, like I lack belief in unicorns. As if unicorns has yeah. anything to do with prime reality and ethics and epistemology or any of those things, okay? What it means to be human. No, a lack of belief in unicorns is not even in the same ballpark as a lack of belief in God, mm -hmm. okay? Not when we're talking about worldview stuff, because there are huge consequences, there are huge implications, okay? And so I just wanted to throw that in there. Um, I think Sire kind of gets at that when he yeah. goes through his questions and we get to the Christian worldview. You see that he keeps pointing back to God everywhere. Like that has everything to do with all these questions. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> and so if you remove God, it, it uh, occurs to me, then all of a sudden that's, that has huge implications, not just like removing belief in unicorns or removing belief in whatever, you know? Um, so anyway, we can move on. Yeah. No, no, that's a great point, Tim. I, I take it back to what I said earlier that you don't say a lot of things that are true. I take that back. Like that was really true. Thanks. Thanks. Really good. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, good. So um, second question he asks is, what is the nature of external reality? What is the nature of external reality? Yeah. So I guess that is like the world around us, you know, mm -hmm. is it real? Is it an illusion? Yeah. Uh, is it orderly? Uh, is it chaotic? You could, you could add in there uh, material world, immaterial world. So not just God existing, but of course, in the Christian worldview, we talk about other spiritual beings, you know, um, and so those are possible on the Christian worldview. And if you're, if you start with prime reality being only matter, well, your external reality can't include anything immaterial. Right. Right. Yeah. So we're seeing a logical progression to these questions almost. Yeah. I'm not sure if that was intentional, but it sure it seems like that's the way it is here. Yeah. What's that, John? I wonder if it's on purpose. Yeah. I wonder. Um, okay, question number three, what is a human being? Okay. Uh, are we an organic machine? Are we just meat? Yeah. <laughs> uh, or are we uh, a combination of a body and a soul? Um, uh, are we, are we an, an actual self or do we don't, or are we, are we just one with all of existence? I mean, there's a whole bunch of variations yeah. opposed to this, right? And, and by the way, what could be, a more practical question, right? Yeah. To do with all kinds of issues today. And so some, some people might be thinking, you know, prime reality, okay, I'm out of here. These guys are getting philosophical. They're yeah. talking about, but man, we have to start there because that has implications of the question, what does it mean to be human? Which yeah. I mean, to me, when we're talking about all the kind of social stuff going on, you got to get back to this question, you yeah. know, um, race and abortion and, you know, pornography. And I mean, you could just sex trafficking and all these things that are just going on in the culture right now can be, can point back to this question. And this question points back to the ones before it. Tim, it seems you're really passionate about this idea that these questions matter. Is that, am I? <laughs> well, it, what, 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 what what bugs me, what bugs me is yes, that, uh, what, what yes. bugs me, okay, let me tell you what bugs me. It's that philosophy gets such a bad, and, and, and I, I think that's what we're doing here, okay? We're doing worldview stuff. It, I mean, it's not just philosophy. There's theology. There's all kinds of stuff going on. Yeah. Here. But it gets such a bad rap because, you know, that's just for those academics up in their ivory towers. That has nothing to do with me and how I live my life. That's just not true. Yeah. Um, but we don't, we don't even, we're too busy watching Cobra Kai at night and, uh, and or whatever on Netflix. These guys are laughing because I, I so was going to watch uh, confessing his sin right yeah, now. Yeah, I'm confessing my sins. I, I was watching Cobra Kai last night and I was, I planned on watching something else that was more edifying and uh, sanctifying, but um, we're too busy with that, that yeah. we are not. And this goes back to what John said. We're not reflecting on our own worldview. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm joking with you, Tim, that you're you're being passionate about this, but you're absolutely right. It's 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 the reason why Francis Schaeffer said what he said. You know, we we try to come at these things in bits and pieces. You know, we see somebody making a case for something, and we go and we try to persuade them otherwise, but we find ourselves just like they're not even hearing us, and it's because of what you guys both have said, and that is. If you go up the, you know, up the chain here in these eight basic questions and begin with prime reality and the nature of external reality and what is a human being, if they got those questions answered in a different way than you do, then it doesn't matter what convincing arguments you're going to have because their fundamental reality is totally different. And that's why oftentimes you're going to have to go deeper. I'm going up on the questions, but yeah, I meant deeper like deeper, more fundamental, like to prime reality or to what is the nature of reality or what is a human being, you know, what is right and wrong and how do we even know these things, these more fundamental worldview questions, we have to go there before we can 
make any headway with um, a much more bit and piece of a thing that Francis Schaeffer talks about. So no, you're, you're absolutely right. I, both of you guys are saying what, what you're saying is really important. And I think, so the first two questions uh, are questions kind of, I think they're the big uh, fundamental questions. And this is the first question here, number three, where what is a human being? We start seeing, this is, this is where we start seeing people doing a lot of borrowing from a different worldview. So this is where I think, uh, you know, we can be really quick to answer what's primeality oh yeah there's no god or there is a god right and then you know what's the what is there a world and we and we think we can answer that but i think we see a lot of inconsistencies as we start talking about what is a human being yeah. uh, in in a lot of regards right because how we answer the first two should necessarily inform how we answer the third and if you answer the first two if you answer the first one prime reality there is no god it's really hard to answer number three here, what is a human being um, with, with any sense of meaning or purpose or uh, a moral nature uh, attached to it. So, it, uh, and I think that this is like in my notes in my book here say that this is where a lot, this is where a lot of people borrow. So this is where a lot of people are stealing from other worldviews here. Yeah. And it's all based on the understanding of the first two questions. Right. So Tim, you're saying about the passion of philosophy and, and being able to understand these higher, uh, we sometimes think that they're higher level things, but they're really not. I mean, this is this is stuff we all think about, just maybe not intentionally enough. Mm -hmm. um, so. and, and this might be a good, uh, it occurs to me that, you know, every movie we watch, you know, I was, I was making a joke about Cobra Kai or whatever, but when you watch, there's worldviews always being put forth in front of us, whether we acknowledge it or not, right? And so you're right, there's, and, uh, and so that's something to consider too. I mean, we, uh, as, as kind of a training tool is we will, I mean, our, our girls are pretty young still, but, um, even at the, you know, young age, nine years old, let's talk about the worldview in this particular, um, movie or, or cartoon that you're watching. Mm -hmm. And yeah. maybe we don't use that kind of, we don't get too deep. We're not talking about prime reality. I don't think I've ever used that term with my seven-year-old <laughs> or my nine-year-old, but uh, there are ways to talk about worldview with with your kids. In fact, I wrote an article about that, and I'll I'll put it in the in the comments. Perfect. Real quick, like I know that we need to keep moving, but uh, what you said really uh, it triggered me, Tim. Um, I uh, there's there there's no such thing as there's no neutrality. Here, there, there's no such thing as uh, as a medium and a form of entertainment, uh, a news article, uh, anything out there that's devoid of a worldview. Everything has a worldview and it has an agenda in that worldview. Uh, so there's no neutrality here. And and I think oftentimes, I know me, I'll speak, speak for me, me personally, I'm going to put a show on to, to keep my kids quiet. Uh, and oftentimes I don't think about the the worldview significance. And then I sit down and watch the show and I'm like, oh my gosh, like <laughs> what, am I, what am I putting my kids in front of, you know, from a worldview perspective? Because uh, there, there's just no such thing as neutrality in this world. And that's, that's I think, something that is, is tried to, the, like, we hide that from ourselves. There's, there's no such thing as neutrality. Everything is coming from a certain worldview. Yeah, really good. Excellent. We're never going to get through this material. I know, I know. Okay, so question four, what happens to a person at death? Mm -hmm. So obviously there's a number of options. Different worldviews are going to answer that differently. Some yeah. might say we're annihilated and that's just the end of existence. Others might say we're <clears throat> reincarnated. Um, others might say there's an afterlife. You go to heaven or hell, right? Um, and, and by the way, within the Christian worldview, there are um diversity of opinions right so there are there are beliefs like we're talking about i said talk about webs right you could talk about multiple webs uh so there's a web over there called that naturalism here's another web called christian theism within christian theism you know there might be um especially on the periphery beliefs that differ between christians okay and there are central beliefs um, the, the doctrine of the Trinity, incarnation, bodily resurrection, you know, those kind of things. And then there are some beliefs that, you know, we differ on. 
even when it comes to some of these questions, well, at least this question, what happens to a person when, when they die? Um, Christians hold to final judgment, but there are people like Chris Date and others who are championing, championing um, conditional immortality mm -hmm. and they're, you know, brothers in Christ. Um, and just as there are, you know, on the origin question, the nature of external reality, there might be differences on the origin question. You know, how does that play out? How many days? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and Christians may have different different opinions on that. Um, and so there's kind of uh, those things to consider too. This goes back to my claim, not all beliefs are equal, okay? Um, some beliefs have bigger implications. And if you get those wrong, then there's, you know, there's, there's big implications. <laughs> and, and if they're, and there's smaller belief, there's, I don't know how, how else to put it, maybe smaller beliefs um, that uh, if you get those wrong, well, you're wrong, but you know, they're, they're not as uh, crucial. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Um, question five, why is it possible to know anything at all? Mm -hmm. Or is it possible to know anything at all? And I guess this would touch on the question about whether we have a, a, a rational mind, we can understand the universe, whether it's, so this is more on probably on, on the epistemology question, right? Yeah. And I think he's also talking about, um, in terms of Christian worldview, a revelation. You know, how do we know about God? Yeah. He would probably put that in there too. Right. So not just knowledge in general, but knowledge about prime reality or whatever. Right. Um, let's see. Question six. How do we know what is right and wrong? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> is, uh, <clears throat> as you were saying earlier, John, is there a transcendent objective moral truths that we can know? Um, is, are those truths grounded in God? Are they, is there no grounding? So relativism, objectivism, all these ideas could, could be options. Yeah. The by, by the way, here's like a little maybe bone to pick with the book and this question. How do we know what is right and wrong? That's, I mean, that's a good question. I think the more fundamental question is not the epistemological question, not the how do you know what's right and wrong, but how do you ground right and wrong? Yeah, the ontological. Yeah. So, so that would be how can there be a right and wrong? Um, I don't know. Maybe that could be. Well, it, that, maybe that, I think that is what he's getting at. It's just okay. the way he asks the first initial question, how do we know what is right and wrong is you're right. It doesn't sound that way. But then he says, um, are right and wrong determined by human choice alone or what feels good? Yeah. So um, I think he's kind of getting at that, but you're right. I. That's yeah. a really important distinction though. Yeah, important you know, distinction. when yeah. you're, when you're watching, you know, debates between Christians and, and atheists and the Christian says, you need God to ground morality. And the atheist says, well, I can know right and wrong just as well as you can. Right, right. You're not talking about the same thing anymore. Right. Okay. They're talking about completely different things. Yeah. And so to me, this is, uh, I don't know. I just, I don't like that. Yeah. That's sire. Let's throw the book away. Yeah, I know. Jeez. Well, I think he was, uh, if I recall, he's not a philosopher, right? He's just a, no. he was a Has publisher. A a, a publisher, right, or someone in related. He does have a PhD. I'm not sure if it's He's in a senior editor for InterVarsity Press. Okay. But yeah, he probably yeah. did. I mean, obviously he traffics in philosophy and theology, but yeah, but yeah, you're right. I, I think we'd agree that that's probably not the best way to word it. Uh, question seven. What is the meaning of human history? So... Yeah, is, is history just a series of events that kind of transpire? Uh, are they culminating or crescendoing into some final event? Um, does history even exist? I mean, all right, there's a whole bunch of questions or possible answers to that question, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I like this question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, It'll be. Well, I mean, it's the, it's the previous one, which you don't like. No, no. Well, it's it's the meaning question. It's the question that I don't think we talk about enough. I no. mean, as an organization, right. um, 
And so uh, I think we need to be talking about this question more because um, it's such uh, excess, it's a, it's deeply existential, right? Um, and a lot of people are asking about meaning and purpose, like objective meaning, not, hey, I've devoted my life to collecting shells or something or stamps um, or, or whatever. Like we're talking about an objective meaning and purpose to your life. And, um, and so this is a really good question. Right. That I think every worldview has to address. That's what I mean. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some of them just have real bad answers and or, or answers that I don't think are sufficient mm -hmm. and lead to places that aren't good. Now that doesn't mean they're not true. Um, but I think that w this is the question where worldviews have to own up, right. To what, to, to their implications. And if it's nihilism or whatever, then you got to bite that bullet. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah. And a lot of people don't want to bite this bullet because a lot of people don't want to say, my life is actually meaningless. My life is actually objectively purposeless. Right. Um, that's a hard, that's a hard pill to swallow. Yeah, that is. So Sire makes a point here saying that earlier editions of this book did, don't include the eighth question. Um, but because in his definition, he talks about how a worldview um, provides the foundation on which we live and move and have our being, he's kind of added this eighth question which is what personal life orienting core commitments are consistent with this worldview. Okay. So in other words, what are we trying to do? You know, fulfill the will of God, blah, blah, blah. And so he gives a bunch of possible answers, right? Any comments on that, Tim? You want to complain about that one? Or more practical of all of them. <laughs> What's right. that? This is where the rubber meets the road. As far as uh, practicality, so it's, it's it's a consistency question. Or, or how are you living? Is it consistent with your worldview? Right. But his yeah. explanation here is like so long for this question. I know. <laughs> My eyes just like gloss over. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's it is a good. I think it's a great addition though to the to the sixth sure. edition because yeah, yeah, you have all these philosophical questions, right? And now where's the rubber meeting the road, right? Yeah. And uh, it's asking you and me whether we we truly um, uh, follow our worldview, right? Mm -hmm. Are we living it out? What a great thing to ask at the end of a series uh, a series of questions. Yeah. So again, those are the eight questions that um, sorry is going to address each of the worldviews. That's kind of ends chapter one. Um, we have about seven minutes to kind of um, address chapter two, which we knew this was going to happen because, and, and we're kind of okay with it a little bit because it is the Christian worldview. It is Christian theism. Although in a sense, you know, you could probably, you could easily devote a whole set episode to this because I think one of the most important things that we as Christians can do is to know our own views, know our own worldview, know our own theology, because, it helps us to be able to recognize counterfeits, you know, false mm -hmm. views. And so if we're so grounded in the truth, whether it be biblical truth or our own worldview, then it'll just, it'll just be a lot easier to spot false views. And I think this is actually one of the mistakes that we as a church have made, mm -hmm. um, especially in light of how I've seen a lot of people get wrapped up. A lot of Christians get wrapped up in some of the current cultural trends it's because they're not grounded in the truth. And so they get yeah. swept up in a lot of ideas that seem to be um, Christian-like, but in reality are grounded in a much more uh, different worldview than ours. Okay, so um, so chapter two is Christian theism. And um, for sake of brevity, we're going to lump in deism. Well, no, we're not. <laughs> we're gonna skip deism and we're gonna skip the chapter on Islamic theism as well. Okay. Uh, not because there aren't differences between theism and deism or theism and Christian, I'm sorry, uh, Islamic theism, but because, um, again, we have to, we only have a limited amount of time and um, deism and Islamic theism are in a sense similar in that they believe that there is a God who's created the universe. This universe is separate from God. So 
it's it's distinguishing enough from say pantheism or naturalism or you know marxism or whatever you know so for that that's the reason why we're not going to be hitting deism or Islamic theism yeah um but okay so how about this guys since we only have about five minutes we <laughs> we've addressed the questions uh, yeah in the abstract but maybe we can just kind of pick something that we thought was significant or interesting regarding those eight questions as they pertain to Christian theism. Sure. Do you want to start, John, or do you want me to? Well, mine was just going to be more of a, an overarching thing. I found sure. myself, as I was reading this, uh, this was a great opportunity for me to revisit um, Tozer's The Knowledge of the Holy. Mm. Like, I couldn't resist myself. That's a book that I read. I read that once a year. And it's short, but it's, yeah. I mean, holy smokes, man. It's so, it's yeah. so chock full of just goodness. And uh, so I'm reading this and I was just really getting swept away in, in the, in, in the attributes of God and who God is and, and how that informs the world around us. And it was just, uh, I, I just really enjoyed, I really enjoyed reading about my own personal <laughs> worldview, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, you know, um, yeah. So that, I mean, that's where I'd start, but I mean, yeah, I, I, have tons of, I have tons of notes here. Uh, and actually, if I was going to point out one thing, it actually wouldn't even be in about what I just said. I thought it was really kind of neat the way that he started by comparing and contrasting the historic West, the Western world to the, the to the modern Western world. And uh, where, you know, I, he says here about the, the old the old world, right? The old Western world. Christianity had so penetrated the Western world that whether or not people believed in Christ or acted as Christians should, they all lived in a context of ideas influenced and informed by the Christian faith. Hmm. And that is just so not true today. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's almost the opposite. And for me personally, like uh, I'm the only Christian in my family. So my the rest of my family is are, are atheists. And it's funny because when I talk to them about stuff, especially like political stuff or whatever, they'll say that they're in the minority. And I always think to myself, I don't think that's true. I mean, I think maybe a hundred years ago that was true. Right. But I don't think it is anymore. I mean, the, the worldview has shifted of, of our of our culture. So anyways, that's what really stood out to me right at the beginning. Yeah. So, so that, Tim, I want to ask you a question about that because I think John brings up an interesting point. Um, one of the aspects, and I think it was question two about external reality that that Sire makes, is that in the Christian theistic worldview, external reality is a physical reality, well, partly physical reality that is separate from God, yeah. that God created ex nihilo. And he says to operate with the uniformity of cause and effect in an open system. Okay. Yeah. Um, and to me, this, this kind of reminds me of what you were saying, John, that uh, you know, up until maybe the last hundred or so years, Christianity, even though it was held by devout, the Christian worldview, even though it was held by, you know, Orthodox believers in Jesus Christ, a lot of the world still held this broadly Christian worldview idea that the universe was out there, that it was orderly, that it was knowable, that it wasn't chaotic. Yeah. And I suspect that's partly why some of the greatest scientific thinking and flourishing happened within that worldview. And I know, Tim, you've kind of spoken on that before. I don't know if you can comment on that. Yeah, I think John could comment on it too, because uh, we're going to do a red pen on this, actually. And he actually did some some uh, some of the legwork uh, in responding. But just, I mean, briefly. Oh, the beauty. What's the, Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so I, yeah, I get to take all the credit because my face is on the, on the red pen stuff. Yeah, but, right. um, the, uh, it's, it's just, um, it's just a matter of historical fact that the sciences, I mean, we could go through other things too, hospitals and I mean, but if we're talking about science in particular, um, it, it was birthed out of a belief in the theistic and I would say majority Christian worldview that there was a there was an orderly creator and that the universe obeyed certain laws because it was created the universe was uniform the cosmos is uniform because god 
is a logical uniform creator, you know, that idea. And, and so um, this, I mean, going back to your original question, like what jumps out, I wrote down here because God is, and he, 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 um, he had this in quotes numerous times. Uh, God is who he is. God is who he is. He kept saying that certain right. things follow about the world. This was kind of what jumped out at me in this, in this section. Certain but things it, follow because God is who he, who he is. So the moral law is going to follow because God is who he is. Um, the uniformity of nature we just talked about, that follows. The laws of logic and rationality and all, meaning in the universe, all these things are going to follow because of who God is. Even, uh, even the challenge of, you know, a, apologetic challenges like the existence of hell. How do we make sense of a God who would send people to hell? And of course, the answer to that is going to follow. Hell is going to make sense if you understand the Christian worldview. If you don't, if you don't understand the Christian worldview, hell isn't going to make sense at all. It's right. just going to seem like some petty, you know, whatever. God just, you know, torturing people for the fun of it. That's not what's really going on when you understand the Christian worldview. So, the, and again, I'm just throwing that out there. I know we don't have time to get into it. Um, but that was a big takeaway for me um, is just seeing him answer all these questions. And it wasn't like the answers were new to me, but it was like this revelation happened. Wow. These things follow from who God is. Mm -hmm. What about yeah. you, Alan? What, what, what jumped out for you? Um, well, the, <clears throat> the part that I just asked you about was one of yeah. them. And also the prime reality aspect. I just thought it was cool when he described the, the attributes of God um, even though I'm familiar with him, but the way he put him, and I, maybe he didn't intend to say this, but he said, God is transcendent and imminent, yeah. one and triune, infinite and personal. It, and these things, those three categories are seemingly contradictory. It's like, well, he's transcendent, which means he's separate from his creation, but he's imminent, which means he enters into his creation and develops a relationship with his created beings, you know, yeah. which is very different than say like Islamic theism. Right. Because yeah. Islamic theism puts a much greater emphasis on God's transcendence, his otherness from humanity. Mm -hmm. But in Christianity, we see God also being imminent, coming back into creation and through Jesus Christ, developing a relationship with us and becoming very knowable. So, yeah. Um, so that so that and then God being one and triune, infinite, but yet personal. And like so I don't know. The, the, the whole chapter is super important, <clears throat> you know. As we've said, we're kind of out of time, and but yet I, I want to encourage all of you who are just joining us or who are planning to join us for the whole uh, book series, book club series, to at very least, even if you're starting late, read chapters one and two. Like this is critical, like yeah. chapter one, because that's the grid by which he's going to address all the other worldviews. And chapter two, because it's the Christian worldview, which I'm assuming if you're watching, you're most likely a Christian. If you're not, that's totally fine. But for those of you who are Christians, man, you've got to know your own worldview. Like this is fundamental to everything else that we're going to be talking about because yeah. you'll see everything else as a departure from that. And it'll train your mind to be able to recognize counterfeit views or false views or views that don't fit reality. And this is going to be so key to not only understanding the world that we have today and the revolution that's happening in our world today, but also the coming revolution in 10 years or in 20 years. Because there's going to be ideas in 10 years or five years or 20 years that we don't know what's going to be in vogue or popular, but they are going to be coming and they are going to transform our culture. And the question of whether you'll get swept up by them or not is whether you understand chapter two, <laughs> you know, your own worldview. Yeah. So definitely do that. Read those first two chapters at the very least if you're falling behind um and then we're gonna come back in two weeks um so september 24th will be our next get together so that's not next thursday but the following thursday and what what the assignment will be or what we're going to be covering that particular week will be chapter four on naturalism mm -hmm. uh so we're skipping chapter three which is deism we're going to just go straight to chapter four, which is naturalism, but don't read pages or you can, but we're not going to cover pages 75 to 81 because pages 75 to 81 are a subsection on 
Marxism. And we're going to save that for a subsequent week yeah. where we'll just address that on its own. Yeah, that topic needs its own yeah. cool episode. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So, sorry to cut short a little bit, but yeah, next uh, next time, episode two will be September 24th on Naturalism, chapter four, with the exception of pages 75 to 81. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's where we're headed. We're we're excited about it. I, I I'm well, I'm excited about it. I don't know. John's kind of like, yeah, I don't want to spend time with you and Tim again. But well, I do. Yeah, I mean, I don't really <laughs> like you guys very much. So I know, I know, but you're faking it so well. Like I, I just appreciate how well, you know, and maybe that the Oscars having new diversity standards. Like, you know, bald and beautiful people like you can be included. And in, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I just I just shaved my head before the. Uh, the episode here, and I'm just—I I, notice I'm just glowing. Um, it's amazing. From, from it's the whole time. It's the best thing well, on your head. We also, though, we want to uh, thank everybody for tuning in. And yeah. uh, I know there—I see a question or two on here that we didn't get a chance to answer, but um, but Tim can go back and answer every single one of them and address them thoroughly. There you go. There the you time. go. So Megan uh, Star asked a question, and I'll—I'll I'll try and hop on. Uh, it was on YouTube. I'll—I'll. I'll, uh, Hop on there and, and uh, try and answer that. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, thanks. Sounds thanks good. Thanks for joining us all. We'll see you guys in two weeks. See ya. Bye. Bye.